beautiful day to worship. Whether you're joining us from home or you're here together, what a day to worship. Tonight, today, let's, let's speak our words of adoration and blessing to God. So as we pray, I want you to, to be courageous, to say that one word or phrase aloud that you just want to shout out to God, sing to him, shout to him words of praise. So we'll have a space for that, and then we'll have a space for more quiet contemplation about who God is and how we can, uh, how we can give what we need to God. So let's pray together. Lord, hear our praises as we shout them to you. Oh, God, we do praise you. Hallelujah. That the, the Hebrew that we all know, praise be to God, Yahweh, the creator of the world who also redeemed us. God, we are just amazed at you. So thankful we get to worship you. But God, sometimes we give our worship to things that are not worthy of worship. We want to confess those now, that sometimes we... We give worship to our stuff, to our work, sometimes even to our families, though we love them. We know that they are not you. God, hear our confessions now. God, thank you so much for your forgiveness. Over and over again, though we turn away, the minute we turn towards you, you are running towards us with open arms. We love you, God, for loving us. We love you for who you are. God, hear now all of the things that we are thankful for. And God, though we are thankful, there is much hurt in our world. There is much pain and sadness. There are those in our community who have lost loved ones and people that we miss, Lord. Please comfort us and those that we love. Please hear our prayers, Lord. Lord, as my sister Kathy said, we've peeked to the end of the story and we know that victory is in you. Help us to find joy and hope in the trials now. Help us to remember the wonderful ending that is to come and has already begun. Help us to be that hope in other people's lives, to tell them how it's not us, how it's not just smiling, but it is the life that has been given to us through your son, through Jesus, Lord. And it is in Jesus' name that we offer this humble prayer. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's right. So if you have your Bibles, let's open them together. Uh, we will be in Romans chapter 8. Uh, and if you have been uh, following us in Romans chapter 8, you will know that we are at a wonderful section today. It is incredible, uh, and it will be challenging for all of us, especially me, who's going to be talking about it. So y'all pray for me, all right? Um, uh, so thankful this morning to have an opportunity to gather. My name is Daniel. Of course, I'm pastor. If you're gathering with us online, we welcome you. We welcome all of us. This is worship at Lillington Baptist, and we're so glad to be together today, aren't we? Okay, let's try that again. We're so glad to be together uh, again today. Praise the Lord. Um, but with all, yeah, thank you. Great job. Uh, thank you for helping the pastor out there. Um, but we, we do because we believe that we are a community of believers being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, sent on a mission to expand the gospel. That is how we feel. That is what we believe. And we're just going to carry forward. Before we carry forward, 
before we carry forward. There have been some gremlins in the machines. Okay? They're all over the place this morning. Um, but I, I kind of want to flip the story. Can I do that with you for one second? Because we have two people in our congregation that have been working on this for a year, almost next weekend, dedicated. And they've been giving it all they have. And for all the changes that we've made, for, for every response that we've made, we've had opportunities. So when you leave today and you see Bill and Matthew, when they know there's gremlins in the machines and they're about to blow up too. Okay? Y'all tell them thank you for me today. Thank you for serving the King faithfully today. Okay? Um, so uh, we've been looking again at Romans chapter 8. And if you would, would you just scan Romans chapter 8 with your eyes with me? If you're sitting at home, just take a second. I want you to scan Romans chapter 8 with your eyes just for a moment. And look at where we've been since we started in verse 18. You know, I consider these sufferings. You know, I, look at where we've been. That where we have a creation that's been designed by God. Created by our Heavenly Father. I believe He did it in six days and took the seventh day to rest. He gave it purpose and a design. And we talked about how we are at our best when we are fulfilling that very design. When I'm filling my design, I'm not at my best. I struggle. But when I'm connected in relationship to God, fulfilling the design that He has made for me as a part of His creation, then I am working to be at my best. We see how not only creation groans because it's frustrated, but we groan because we're frustrated, don't we? Husbands, don't poke your wives and wives, don't poke your husbands. Because we know it's true. We groan. We become frustrated. But just because we're frustrated doesn't mean we don't have an advocate, a helper that is groaning for us as well. And do you remember his groans, don't you? He groaned for us at the cross. It is finished. It's done. We have victory and freedom in him. All of these things, a Holy Spirit, a design, a Savior, help us to contend with our frustrated nature in a frustrated world. And that's kind of the journey that this passage has been on. And now we're going to end it. Now we're going to, but I need to give you, um, I need to give you new vision and new glasses today. Okay. Now, some of you have great vision and you don't need glasses. Okay, I'm uh, not going to say anything else about that because I'm a little jealous. But those are those of us like me who wear contacts or need glasses and we're physically, we can't see a thing without them. Uh, and you would say, for those of you who are perfect, you have 20 20 vision. Today, we're going, we want to develop 50 20 vision. Okay, it's not as good as 20 20 with your eyes, but it really is with your heart. So let's look at this passage together and we're going to say it together. I'm going to say a portion, you're going to repeat after me. We're going to call it an echo. Are you with me? So everybody say yes together. All right, thank you. That's how you echo. All right, so I'm going to say a section. I want you to say it right after me. You intended to harm me. But God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. Now, hold on to that verse. Underline it or put, put your little jot note on the side. You may need to write this on an index card. Put it in your car when you're driving around. Because we live in a frustrated world. But don't be fooled. The frustration doesn't stop the plan of God. This is the passage that refers to Joseph's um, uh, encounter with his brothers after being sold to slavery. After being accused of horrible things. After being put in prison. After being elevated by God to second in command over Egypt. And all of this happened because his brother sold him into slavery. This was his comment to them. When they should have blamed him. When he should have been upset in the middle of all of that heartache and frustration. He says what you intended to, to harm me. God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. I believe that. God does the same thing for us today. I believe He's doing the same thing around us. A few years ago, there was a gentleman by the name of Pacheco. Uh, he worked for United Airlines, and he was out at the DFW airport. Now, if you don't know DFW, my wife and I do. You know, 
massive, like number three largest airport in the nation, just huge place to go. And Mr. Pacheco was driving in, coming into the, the area that he's supposed to come into for his time at work. For some reason, some massive car accident happened. And his car was flipped, turned over upside down, and started to be engulfed in flames. At that moment, one of his um, co-workers, uh, uh, Wigglesworth, uh, no, excuse me, Wugsworth, stepped out of his little hangar where he was working on a plane, just at that very moment, saw him, saw his car flipped over and engulfed in flames and ran out and helped him out of the car, saved his life. Of which he thanked him. You saved my life. Thank you so much. Well, well, excuse me, Wolsworth said in response to that, I was just at the right place at the right time. Just at the right place at the right time. You ever had a moment like that? Just at the right place at the right time. Let me tell you, Jesus is not like that story. He is always at the right place, always at the right time, ready to save and help. He's always at the right places. He's, he's not just going to happen in your life when you're frustrated. It's not just going to happen in our world when we're frustrated. He has a plan. He has a creation. He has a design. And he's always in the right place doing the right thing. And so this world that we feel like we're frustrated in or we have heartache, yes. Yes, we do, don't we? But God has a plan. And it involves the saving of many lives. Sometimes it's my life. Sometimes it's ours. Sometimes it's somebody that I didn't think I would meet. But he's got a plan. So let's pick up right there in Romans chapter 8. We're just going to read these verses. And they're deep. And I'm actually going to tell you to circle a dangerous word today. So get ready. If you have your pen, get it out right now. Because we're going to go through this passage. Beautiful passage. Romans chapter 8. And we know that in all things. Say all things with me. All All right. All doesn't leave anything out. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he has glorified. May God bless his word in our hearts and minds. I want to tell you one thing before we jump into this passage, because some of you, I see it in your eyes, you're already getting nervous. This passage is all about God. It's all about God. It's about what he has done. It's about what he has completed in Jesus Christ. It is not about man. It's not about our efforts. It's not about our free will. It's not about our choice. This is about what Jesus Christ has done and what God has done. So this morning, as we all struggle with this passage, as I did this week, let's put all of the focus on God and let's make so much of what He's done today. So this passage, again, we're just going to break it apart like we always do every morning. We know, we've come to this conclusion in our experiences in life, and this is Paul talking, most likely from behind a prison bar in Rome. We know suffering. Paul knows suffering. But we know in all of this, in all things, we've had some experiences. Let's carry forward. We know that in all things, God works for the good. He has a uh, 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 work to accomplish. Let's call it a mission. I like to call it a mission. And it's for good, benevolence. It's for not just any good, brothers and sisters. It's for your good. Okay? For those who love Him, for those who are in a relationship with Him, for those who have asked Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior, who they, they've asked forgiveness and they've made Him the highest priority in their life. He is King and Lord. And who have been according, excuse me, called, according, uh, called, invited, according to his purpose. So I want you to take a second right now and underline the word purpose or circle it or just make a mental note about this. Write a little jot note in the corner of your Bible. Because please understand, brothers and sisters, if this passage is all about God, then while I'm so glad that he works all things out for good, I want to focus on his purpose. His purpose. I believe that God has a few purposes. I want to highlight 
just the top three with you for a minute. The first one is, I believe that God is all about His own glory. Everything God does is to magnify God because He's God. And if He's God, you really want Him to be God, so you want Him to magnify Himself over and over and over again. So I believe God is primarily concerned. His plan is always to bring glory to Himself. I believe God's plan to bring glory for Himself is best seen, number two, in Jesus Christ. We get the fullest picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus, for us, is the greatest glory of God. It is our salvation and how we see Him. But number three, in Jesus Christ, we are saved. In Jesus Christ, we get to experience the plan of God through salvation. Now that's important. That phrase is massively important. We get to experience the plan of God through salvation. But this isn't just for me and you. Because this is about God. And this passage it refers to all of creation. All of us. So I'm going to give you a little phrase. Let's hold on to it for a minute this morning. God has a global plan. I'm going to call it His story. Now if you say His story really fast, what do you get? History. That's right. His story has always been about His glory. I'm not trying to rhyme. It just happened to work that way this morning. Now, His glory is best seen in Jesus Christ, which we get to experience through salvation, which has been history for all of us. God has a global plan that involves every person, everything He's ever created, everything He's going to create. It involves all of it, and it's to bring Himself glory through His Son, which we get to experience in salvation. Now, we, there are other things that we want to Remember about this, it's for our good, yes. It is for all things, yes. But I want you to walk away from this first verse with an understanding that God has a global plan. Let me tell you a story about my wonderful wife. She gets to make great food. One of my favorite things that she makes is this Dorito taco casserole. Okay, It has Doritos in it. Who doesn't love Doritos? It has taco stuff in it. Love taco stuff and cheese. You remember the commercial about cheese, right? Cheese makes everything better. Just this wonderful grab. Now, but if you know me, I'm a grazer. Once I come home from doing what I'm doing, I start eating and I don't stop until I go to bed. Okay? And so she's making, you know, at, you know Dorito taco casserole, which is wonderful, one of my favorite things. And I start grazing. A little Dorito here. Little piece of cheese there. Now it's great to have. Love eating it. But I know it would be best if I waited till the end. Because when she puts it in and cooks the taco meat and the cheese and the Doritos and everything else that she puts in there, the flavors start to they come alive. You know what I mean? It's just wonderful. Now the same could be said about the condition of history. We like to graze through history and pick out our favorite parts or our most hated parts. But I absolutely believe today that God has a global plan. And we need to bear up, gather strength in the power that God has for us because it will be best enjoyed when He's doing the cooking. It will be best enjoyed if you don't just pick and choose a little bit here and there, but if you watch and participate and become a part of His master chef plan now, we want Him to be the master chef, don't we, right? We want Him to do the all things, work together for good according to His purpose. Now, let's carry on. Now, dangerous word. I want you to circle on this passage. Great passage. All right. Verse 29. For those God foreknew. Underline circle foreknew. Now, we, we like to, we get really dangerous about this passage and we start questioning things like free will. The only problem is that this passage is all about God. It's not about you. So while we could discuss free will another time, okay? Today, I want us to magnify God. This is about Him. Because God has a knowledge that is before all of us. That's actually what this means. He knows things before we knew things. He has foreknowledge. He has foreknowledge so great that it was actually before anything was created. God foreknew. Now, next, He also predestined. Again, I would circle it and underline it and I wouldn't be afraid of it. 
Because this is a wonderful passage because it lets me know that God also determined. God also has a plan. He has a purpose. Before everything got started, God knew it. He has a plan. He has a purpose. Now again, we want to say, but Daniel, what about my free will? How does this work out? Hold on to that. God loves you. Okay? But right now, this is all about God. So God foreknew. He has a plan. Circle, underline, predestined there. Uh, for us to be conformed to the image. Whose image? Whose image? Jesus Christ. His Son. Uh, we said it at the beginning. We believe we are to be conformed. Patterned. Modeled into the image of Jesus Christ. So let me, let me take our, our, our frustration away. And our fears for this passage. Let me, write, let me raise up Jesus Christ in this. Okay? And say it to you this way. Because before Adam and Eve were created, God had a plan. And that plan was all Jesus Christ. Now, I know it's not good English, but please forgive me. I went to school in South Georgia. All right. You would like for me to say it's all about Jesus. It is. But it's also all Jesus. We're to be conformed into his image. He is the agent of creation from the beginning he was the only plan. He is the plan today. It's not me. It's not my efforts. It's not what I can do. It's all about Jesus. Praise God that before I sinned, before I struggled, He has a plan. Praise His name that before I feel frustration and pain of this world, the plan is Jesus. And Jesus saved everything. God has a global plan. And it's all about Jesus. Now, I want to put a little note on this side. I personally, as pastor, believe, yes, that we have a free will. And my free will is best experienced in choosing Christ. I, I, I don't want to take that away from you. But I also don't want to make salvation about me. I want to make it about Jesus Christ today. And His plan is all about Him. From the beginning of His story, to the end of his story. And so my best role to be played. Is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Um, as you guys know, I, I, I like to tell stories and that's just that's just my way. Um, in uh, 1996, um, there was a gentleman who uh, was driving to the airport, um, I believe, and he got uh, caught on the Palmetto State Highway. Um, I, I remember that really well. Uh, he had a flat tire, and he's so frustrated. Um, he's on his way to the airport to catch a plane. And sitting there complaining, and tow truck driver comes up, help him change a tire, give him a new tire, whatever that repair person came in was. And he and and said, you know, I'm just so upset. I'm so mad. Can't you hurry up? He said, Why are you such? I'm trying to get to a plane. Plane. You don't want to get on a plane today. Why don't I want to get on the plane today? Because on that day, which is the day that the very plane he was supposed to be on, Value Jet 592, crashed. And I know it's hard for us to grab. It's hard for us to get. God has a foreknowledge and a determined plan. But I praise the Lord that that plan that I'm sometimes unaware of, sometimes I'm frustrated about. Sometimes I want it to be different, just like him sitting on the side of the road with a flat tire. I praise the Lord that it is always, always for good. Now, I can't promise that that means that, that we're going to escape tragedy, but I can promise that it means it's always for good, because that's what he said. God has a global plan that involves Jesus Christ, and so this lets me in on two words that I wanted you to Right down on the side. They're not, in the, they're not in your word right now. But they are going to be in your word. Maybe in just a moment. I believe the best way that I can pattern my life. And, and become a part of this plan. His story. Is number one. To stay in his word. Okay. Now again. I, I, at our house. We do some reading. Okay. And if I read. I'm reading a story. Okay. And if I'm going to read the story. And, and, and understand the story. Then you know what I've got to do. Right. I've got to read the story. If I want to understand his story, then I need to stay in his word. I stay in his word by 
at my time, I study, I read, I pray over, I meditate. Then I also apply. Got to apply it. I also want to make sure I'm involved with a small group Bible study. We have several small group Bible studies that meet. Okay? Whether it's a youth group, a children's ministry, whatever it is, you need to make sure that you're connected. Because if you want to fulfill the plan of Jesus, become conformed to the pattern of Jesus, I think it's necessary that we study His Word with other people and apply it. So that means that we're a part of small groups, Sunday school classes. There are three of the teachers in here right now, and they, in my opinion, guys, now y'all, oh, Paul and Cindy, and y'all were highly successful in what you did this morning. They gathered people together online in a building to study God's word so that we be conformed to the image, which is exactly what Romans chapter 8 tells us to do. Word. I want to be in his word studying. The second thing is, second, is the word community. I believe it's just as important that I study his word, but I also think that it's important for me to be a part of a community that can help lift me up, support my life, pray for me, watch my life, help keep me accountable. I believe I grow best in community. I'm not isolated. I can't just grow by myself. I need help. So I have people around me to help me with that. So if I'm going to be conformed to the image of God, I want to stay in His Word, and I want to stay in His community. And maybe, maybe today you might say, well, I need to get involved in that. Well, you've got three people here in the room you can talk to today about that. You say, I want to join that group. I want, no matter what I'm doing, I'm going to be with you next week. We have others too, though. And maybe you need to join one of their groups. But today is the day. If you're sitting at home and sending us an email, text us right this minute, because we believe that it is necessary to study God's Word so that we can be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. God has a plan. It's a global plan, and it's all about Jesus. And then we hit verse 30. Well, first, let me go back just a, a half a sentence. For those God, He also foreknew to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. I, I want to parse that with you just for a second, just for a moment. When it says He's the firstborn, He is Jesus. He is the firstborn of salvation because He secured it for us. But He's not the last. Praise God, He's not the last. He is the first of many. Now, years later, I'm a part of that many. And so the, the way that we secure this is by the work of Jesus Christ. I'm going to put another word there for you. It's adoption. He's the firstborn, but I'm born again. He's the firstborn, but we're born again. And if you're not born again, then you're not in the family. If you're not in the family, then you don't get to enjoy the, ma- the, the, the master chef's meal the same. So today, the invitation. Be part of the family. I mean, this is all about God. Don't you want to be a part of his family today where he's working everything out for good? Don't you want to be part of his story? But there's a little mission note in here. Brothers and sisters, we are Lillington Baptist Church and charged as individual believers and as a church to spread the adoption of Jesus Christ. He's the firstborn. We're the many, but there's supposed to be many more. And maybe this week you need to go share your faith. Really? And you're asking, Daniel, I'm not trained. It's not about training today. It's about his story. He'll equip. He'll help you when you get there. Yes. But maybe there's somebody God's laid on your heart. You need to share, share the gospel story with them. Uh, number two, uh, we also do have tracks and stuff we'd like to share with you to help you out with that. Number two, maybe you need to invite somebody to join the community. To say, hey, I want to join the youth group. You know, I want to join the children's ministry. I want to come be a part of your Bible study. I want you to come be a part of Bible study with me. You get the idea. If there's a story about adoption and we're charged with sharing the adoption story, now, this week, is the time to do that. Will you accept that invitation? And then there's verse 30. Again, now I love the word predestined because it reminds me that God has a plan. And it's been all about Jesus. And those God predestined, He also called. He invited into a faithful relationship. He also called. He justified, made right. He made us right. Remember, this is all about God. How did He make us right? 
He sent His Son to die on the cross for us, an atoning sacrifice for all of us. For those He justified, He also glorified. The greatest glory that we can have as creation, the greatest glory, has just been revealed to us in this passage. Our greatest glory is to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And so I believe without a doubt that as I'm being conformed, I may be frustrated and I may be groan and I may groan. But it's for my good. It's for my best good. I am at my best when I am fulfilling his design, his purpose. I'm at my best. When I'm being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, that's when I get to be the best part of glory. Get to experience the best part of glory is when I'm being conformed into His image. So that means that with every bit, with all that I have, while this passage is all about God, I want to surrender my story for His story. I want to surrender my life for His life. That's my best thing that I can do. Um, we all know who Albert Einstein was, right? Incredibly smart, E equals MC squared, theory of relativity. You're like, I know those words, but I don't understand them. To be fair, I don't fully understand them either. I just know the words. Albert Einstein moved to America from uh, Nazi Germany. It was a horrible time. Fleeing to a free nation. He... he got a house just a few blocks away from Princeton University. Uh, Everybody knows who Albert Einstein is today. Everybody there knew who Albert Einstein was as well. He would often entertain very important people who would come and talk to him about his ideas and plans. There was also 10-year-old Emmy. Emmy liked to come and visit him too. Unfortunately, Einstein's friends and Einstein's housekeeper did not think it was such a good idea for Emmy to be bothering one of the smartest people that existed, Albert Einstein. And so she would often catch her at the door and shoo her away, or somebody else would say to Mr. Einstein, you know, Mr. Einstein, why do you allow Emmy to go around this house so much? You know, she, she shouldn't be bothering you. You've got important work to do. And, and Albert would say, stop. Like I know him on a first name basis. Mr. Einstein would say, stop. That's Emmy. Emmy has questions about her class. She wants to learn. And it is my joy to teach her. When we come to God and we surrender our lives to Him, knowing that He is the master chef, the great teacher. It's not like He's up in heaven judging us and watching us. What He does is a very similar thing. He says, you're invited. Welcome. Come in. And when you come in, I want to teach you because if it's your joy to learn, it's my joy to teach. And so he says, come in. And we start to be conformed to the image of Christ because that is our greatest glory. So maybe today, we just identify together that God's not going to dismiss us. He's not going to shoo us away. Because he's got a plan. In fact, his plan is already inviting you right now. It's already inviting us right now. Would we commit to doing our human best to be conformed to his image? To be in his word and community today. That's our commitment. To be a part of his mission. To spread his adoption all around us. Heavenly Father, would your hands come around us to pattern us after Christ, to to shape us, to be like your son? We want to be a part of your design. So today we're just asking that you would take your hands and inform, inform us to be like your son. We want this because we realize we're at our best. It's for our joy. We get it. So we surrender our lives as best we can to you today. And maybe this is your first time and you need to say, Heavenly Father, 
I realize I've been on my own plan. And today I ask you to forgive me of that. Forgive me of my sin. I surrender my life to you for you are the son of God that died on the cross and rose again on the third day. May God bless us. Amen.